Bibles, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to look at the whole chapter, verses 1 through 15 this morning. And um, as you're opening up there, I would invite you, if you don't have your own copy of God's Word, uh, to open up to page 1332. 1332 in the Pew Bible. And uh, you'll be able to follow along there. As you're opening up there, I do want to say a word of gratitude to this great church for her generosity. It's fitting, I suppose, on uh, a Sunday where we're talking about uh, Christian giving. But uh, last Sunday, we did uh, raise some money at our church auction. I think it was at least close to our high watermark for that auction, right, Becky? We netted $13,000 for our missions fund uh, here last Sunday. So we just praise God for that. I think it was up from like 8,600 last year, something like that. So uh, some of you might be feeling the effects of that this week. I don't know. I hope everyone's been able to eat supper. But uh, we, uh, we were able to raise a significant amount of money uh, last week there. And so praise God. Praise God for your generosity and in, in giving in this way. Well, if you have your Bibles open there, why don't you go ahead and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. I understand this is a long passage. If you're unable to stand that long, I believe the Lord would understand. And so if you need to sit, you can. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God himself is speaking to us. Beginning in verse 1. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year. And your zeal stirred up most of them. But, but I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find you are not ready, we would be humiliated. To say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided or purposed in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness And you'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this servant service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing, overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from what? From your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. Let's pray. Oh God, open our hearts and our minds to be changed by Your Word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When I was the pastor at Sunnyside Baptist Church in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, uh, Whitney and Watsy and I had to make a trip back to Alabama, and it had a twofold purpose. One was unfortunate and sad situation. We had to come back a little earlier than we'd planned to because we were coming back for me to preach my grandfather's funeral. My mom's dad passed away, and I was coming to coming home to preach that funeral but we'd already planned to come home later in that week because I was to preach at my home church on a Sunday night First Baptist Church of Boaz right up the road from here and in attendance would be the search committee from First Baptist Church of Gadsden so I was sort of preaching there for them and uh, so this was right in the around this time of year and uh, we were getting ready to preach in view of a call I was preaching my grandfather's funeral so it was just really a heavy time in a lot of ways you know there's a lot 
on the line. So Whitney and, and Watson and I are on our way uh, back to Boaz to, to, to do those different things. And uh, my car broke down on the interstate on the way there in Franklin, Kentucky. Franklin, Kentucky is uh, not necessarily a very small town, but it's close enough to Nashville to where you don't have a lot of services in town. And so we sat on the side of the road waiting on a tow truck to tow us to the Hampton Inn in Franklin, Kentucky. My dad had gotten us a room there so we could wait till he would come get us. And so he's got a little Smokey and the Bandit in his blood anyway, and so he was pumped about getting to come get us. I think he was, he was praying he would get pulled over just so he could say, I'm, I'm speeding and I can. So we came and got us, we, we did there. So we were waiting on the tow truck, and you can imagine how happy Whitney is about having a basically newborn baby on the side of the interstate, right, waiting on a uh, tow truck to come get us. And finally the tow truck pulls up, pulls up and backs up in front of us. And I look, there on the back of the window, the tow truck has his life motto, I suppose, on the back in vinyl letters. Hooking ain't easy. And I said, ain't that the truth, brother? <laughs> I think I'm going to get something put on the back of my car. Tithing ain't easy. <laughs> Generosity can be really hard. It, it, it can be difficult. Um, we, we can struggle to be generous. I think all of us have had these months and moments where we give unto the Lord and, and probably some of us have had months where it was less than a tithe, and we still didn't know how it was going to work. We, 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 out of conviction, we gave, and yet it was hard. And, and I'm sure some of us have added up how much we've given over the years and thought, man, that's a lot of money. I, it's hard sometimes to give. However, I'm constantly stunned. I mean, absolutely stunned by God's grace in the life of His church. Because over and over and over again, I am reminded of the work of God through the generosity of the Lord's people. I am stunned so regularly by how generous God's people can be. And, and brothers and sisters, if you think that the sum total of the generosity of God's people, even only at this church, is summed up on the back of the chimes, you'd be wrong. I, I do have a unique vantage point that sometimes I get to facilitate and witness generosity among God's people that, that makes me want to weep with joy over the way God's people love one another and bear one another's burdens and care for one another. I, in fact, I'm not sure there's, there's any sign of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people than just the overwhelming nature of Christian generosity. The goodness and the generous nature of the Lord's people over and over again reminds me that the Holy Spirit is real and that He's at work and that the gospel is going forth. Every year we start a new budget. Every year we start over at zero, so to speak. And every year by the Spirit you continue to give and allow this amazing mission to continue. Last week, like I've just mentioned, we netted over $13,000 at an auction, and now we get to fund our backpack ministry, and we get to fund mission trips, and we have some room there because you're so generous to give to some special causes, like, like, like the Alabama Baptist Children's Homes. We're able to give a special gift to them through the Finance Committee because of your generosity. And we get to help fund other things, the IMB, North American Mission Board, our seminaries, other things in Southern Baptist causes we get to give to because God's people are faithfully generous. They give. And all of us have had those moments, myself included, where letting go of that money was hard. You were holding on to it with white knuckles, you know, and your left hand had to know your right hand was given because you needed it to open your hand up. We've all been there. I know how hard it can be to let go of money. And so I love to see the Holy Spirit work in my own heart, my wife's heart, and in the hearts of the Lord's people to, to demonstrate Christian generosity, to make us generous. It is countercultural to be generous. It, it is countercultural 
to give money away. And so this morning, I want to show you five marks of a Christian giver. Five points this morning. Five marks of a Christian giver. And we'll move it a good clip, don't worry. Five marks of a Christian giver. Here's the first. A Christian giver is a willing giver. A, a, a Christian giver is a willing giver. You see Paul, now, now listen, I think in verses 1 through 5, I don't want to be disingenuous here, it's clear there's some practicalities that are involved here. Pa- Paul's sending folks to make sure the gift is ready, but I think if you take chapter 8 and chapter 9 together, the overwhelming nature of what Paul is driving at with the Corinthian church is, we want you to give willingly. You've committed to do this, but at the same time, we're not going to come try to embarrass you. We're not going to come try to force you. I'm sending these brothers just to make sure that you've reminded yourselves of this need. I know you're going to do it, but I just want to make sure because I'd hate to embarrass you and and, and to be embarrassed myself. But but his rationale, he says, is this. He says, I I want to arrange in advance for the gift you have promised, verse 5, so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Christians are not tax collectors. We, we don't tax the Lord's people. We, we, we don't excise money. We don't, we don't require as the church money from the Lord's people. Instead, we recognize there's a willingness in giving that pleases the Lord. And instead of trying to just constantly beat people over the head with force over why you must give and Instead, our goal and my goal, and I think the biblical picture is instead to try to demonstrate over time why you should want to give to the Lord. Not, hey, you better do what you're supposed to do, but instead, don't you want in on this? Don't you want in on what God is doing? We, we want to cultivate willing hearts in our giving. How do we do that? As Nathan said earlier, it doesn't take long to connect generosity and gratitude, giving and thanksgiving. So if you want to cultivate a willing heart in your giving, the biggest thing I'll give you to do is to be thankful, to live thankful lives. I think as we look through this passage, you see over and over and over again the way that this giving is an overflow of thanksgiving to the Lord. And so if we want to cultivate willing hearts, we must be a thankful people. You see, it's hard to be generous when you spend your time thinking about what God's not giving you. I think we've all been there, haven't we? Why'd God give this person this when he could have given me that? God's blessings are not a zero-sum game. This is why the Bible tells us not to covet. It's an indictment on God's ability to bless his people. It's saying that when your neighbor has a donkey or a wife or whatever else, it means that you therefore can't be blessed by God in the same way, and that's not the case. Or it, it looks at our, our receiving from the Lord as something we're owed. And I assure you, brothers and sisters, God owes you nothing. God owes you nothing. And yet, He's blessed us in so many different ways. We ought to be thankful. Another way to cultivate a willing heart in giving is to see gospel impact. This is part of what Paul's trying to demonstrate is how the money will be used and to show them throughout this passage how it will be impacting saints and how it will impact the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe if you can catch a vision and we want to continually communicate to you how your funds, one of the reasons we started our retrospect prospect business meeting that we do in the spring every year, because we want to show the way that your generosity is multiplying in gospel impact throughout the church, throughout the community, and all across the world. See gospel impact, be thankful, and pray, pray, pray. Pray that God would give you a willing heart. Ask God to make you willing. Ask God, say, God, please help me. I'm reluctant today to give to you. Would you make me willing? I believe you will. A Christian giver is, first of all, willing, but second of all, a Christian giver is generous. Uh, A Christian giver is generous. What does the Bible say? Verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be a big giver. I kind of hate that idea. 
that thought. I've said this to y'all multiple times. Whenever we talk about stewarding our facilities or stewarding our legacy, stewarding the gospel here, back in the day when things were a little, a little uh, more difficult than they are now, when we were kind of talking about paving a way forward to make sure that First Baptist Church Gazin continued on into the future, I would say all the time there's a lot of widow's mites that have been given to this cause over the years. There's a lot of folks that have given sacrificially. We owe it to previous generations to make sure that we are faithful today. You see, it doesn't mean we give a lot. In fact, Jesus shows us sometimes the smallest gifts mean the most in God's economy. But we do recognize we give with a generous heart. What does generosity look like for a Christian? What does it mean to be generous? Now, I will say, one thing I've noticed has happened in our culture and society, anytime somebody who's mega rich gives to something, people will try to analyze how much that is for the average person. This person gave $50 million to this cause. You say, That's like giving $30 if you're a normal human being. Yeah, I hate that. $30? Anybody who gives, we, we need to be thankful. And, and, and so what does it mean to be generous as a Christian? How do we, des, how do we, how do we define generosity? Well, I think this verse helps us define it, right? I I think this verse helps us define what generosity looks like as a Christian. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I think there's some things implied here. Christian giving is proportionate. You give out of what you receive. And, And the Lord doesn't give us fixed amounts. He gives us percentages. He gives us scalable amounts that He asks us to give. And so I do believe in tithing and advocate for tithing for believers. And, and so 10% for me is 10% is different than 10% for some of you. So some of us, for some of us, 10% is very little. For some of us, 10% is a whole lot. And for some of us, we recognize God's blessed us in such a way that we give beyond 10%. And, and, and so we recognize that Christian giving is meant to be proportionate. It's meant to be based on how much you have received. Isn't the Lord good to be gracious to us and to give us percentages rather than fixed amount? That we're not sitting around scrambling, trying to figure out how to get X amount of dollars to be faithful to Jesus, that we give out of what He's given us. I love it. Uh, This language of sowing and reaping tells us also that I think Christian generosity means it ought to be regular there's a picture here when we use this sort of harvest language. The harvest is something that happened yearly. It happened over time. You sow and reap regularly. And such is the case with Christian giving. I think it ought to be regular. I think it ought to be something you do regularly. And there is something about the discipline of giving to the Lord regularly. Sowing and reaping regularly unto the Lord that helps discipline us and helps mold our hearts and helps some of these other things fall into place. But Christian giving is also to be bountiful. The one who reaps bountifully gives bountifully. There's a sense in which Christian giving and generous giving for a Christian won't make sense. It it oftentimes gives more than it has to. We're not trying to get down to the bare minimum, but we're trying our best to give unto the Lord in a way that pleases Him. Now I want you to hear me this morning. Some of you watching on TV, some of you here today, you may not have enough to make ends meet. And I think there are preachers um, who have sort of bought into some thoughts that are unhelpful on tithing and giving. And I want you to know that I don't think the Lord wants you to starve to death to give to His church. And if you're at home and some other, you know, you've changed the channel from some other TV preacher and he said something like, if you'd give more, you'd have more and some of this kind of thing, that is not from God. That is an American anti-gospel. In fact, the things we get back from giving to the Lord, very rarely does the Bible talk about them in monetary terms. In fact, in this passage, it says you reap bountifully, and it says after you sow bountifully. And he, he, he goes on to define what some of those things look like, and it's things like righteousness. It's things like thanksgiving. I, I am not telling you that if you give to God, you will be rich in this life. What I'm saying is, is that we are bountiful givers. And I'm saying if you are struggling to feed your family and you're a member of this church, you just come talk to me about what that might look like to be faithful to Jesus in your giving. 
And, and guess what? This church would love to walk with you and help bear your burdens. If you're a member of this church and you can't feed your family, we would love to do what we can do to help bear your burdens because that's what the Bible has told us to do. A Christian giver is willing, is generous, and a Christian giver, third of all, is cheerful. A, a Christian giver is cheerful. Verses 7, 8, 9. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. You see, it's so easy to fall into the trap of being a reluctant, joyless giver. And I think one of the heresies in America that has zapped the joy out of giving for so many of us is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. That even though we are not uh, that sort of church, even though we're not that sort of people, a lot of... A lot of Baptist pastors over the years have started to use the tactics, the tactics of health, wealth, and prosperity hucksters in order to try to get their church offerings to grow. And what that does, when we start to say things like, if you want God to bless you, you better bless Him. And we start to say those sorts of things. What that does is it drains the joy out of giving to the Lord. Because it becomes a transaction. It becomes like paying somebody who promised to get you rich and you never get rich. It's like we're all caught up in some sort of sub-Christian pyramid scheme and we're all the ones who never get richer. That is not the picture of Christian giving. The Bible says each one should give as he has purposed in his heart. Now what I can do is show you my convictions about giving from the Bible. And I can say, I believe this is what the Bible says. And I believe that you ought to let the Bible shape your convictions. And in your own heart, you ought to get before God. And you ought to say, Lord, you've given me this. What do I need to do with it? What do I need to do with it? And I want that to fill you with joy that God has an answer. I want it to fill you with joy that God says you can get in on this. I, I want you to feel cheerful. I, I want you to feel cheerful knowing that as I give unto the Lord, God will take money, something I can use for sin, something I can use for awful things, something that one day won't exist, and God will use it to give back to me things that last forever. He says He will return unto you the ability to, to perform every good work. He says in verse 9, there's a harvest of righteousness. He says there's an abundance of thanksgiving. God is taking these things, and our joy is found in the fact that God can take our money that is so temporary and He can use it forever. He can use it forever. Oh, pray that God would give you joy in giving. God loves a cheerful giver. And isn't it so beautiful? Isn't it so beautiful that when you give cheerfully unto the Lord, He loves it wouldn't you rather have the Lord's pleasure, the Lord's joy? Wouldn't you rather have a mutual exchange of love and joy than just stuff back? When you give your family Christmas presents, what do you like best? The presents you get back or the looks on their faces? When you exchange gifts with your spouse what do you like more the fact they're giving you something back or the joy of an exchange God's saying we meet together in joy in cheerful joyful giving God is happy about it too doesn't that transform your giving doesn't that transform your tithing doesn't that make it easier to hit enter on the online giving doesn't it make easy make it easier to drop that check in the plate doesn't that make it easier to give to your compassion international child every month doesn't that make it easier to give to a stranger who seems to be in need christian giving is willing it's generous 
cheerful, and fourth of all, Christian giving is faithful. A, a, a Christian giver is faithful. You see, we give trusting the Lord and the Lord alone. Verse 10, 11. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. To believe that, it takes faith. Because when that money leaves your account, when that money leaves your hand, you know it's not mine anymore. It it no longer belongs to me. And it takes some faith to trust that the Lord of seed time and harvest, when you sow those seeds, that He is able to make them sprout and grow. Giving away money doesn't make sense. And yet God will supply for our need. And that doesn't always look the way we want it to look. You know, sometimes we, we, we give away 10% of, of what we receive here. We give it to the cooperative program that helps fund Southern Baptist causes around the world, including our North American Mission Board, our International Mission Board, the State Convention here in Alabama. But one of the things we fund is seminaries. We, we fund seminaries. It makes it affordable for Southern Baptist students to go to seminary. And just a few weeks ago, I was in Louisville for a doctoral seminar, and there's a young, young guy, I guess around my age, I don't know, from India there. He was talking about it was his dream to be able to study preaching at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. You just think about the way that we give in faith to these things and don't always see it, but here we're providing a place for a young man from India to be able to come and study and learn about the Lord. He he emailed me this week, asking me to pray for him that God would provide enough for them to cover their apartment rent and cover their electrical bill. He shared in class about how in the past he had been in a refugee camp because there were, there were race riots in his area of India and his house had been burned down. And he was preaching in his message and he said, we've all been through trials, for example. I once was in a refugee camp because somebody burned my house down. We all kind of looked at each other and said, no, we've not all been through trials, my friend. You've been through trials. We get upset when somebody writes us an ugly letter. It's different. You think about these brothers who make these sacrifices, and we don't always see where our giving goes, but we give in faith. We give trusting that that the money will get where it needs to get, and that people who are willing to walk two miles to class to study preaching are being helped by our giving. We give faithfully, trusting the Lord, trusting that He's able to produce thanksgiving in others through our giving. But finally, fifth of all, a Christian giver is hopeful. A a, a Christian giver is hopeful. When that money leaves our hand, we hope in God. Paul said, if if the resurrection is not true, if Jesus is dead, we are of all people most to be pitied. And we recognize that, that it doesn't make sense if Jesus isn't alive, to give money away. We might as well enjoy this life. We should eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Unless, if after tomorrow we die, there is a life to come. And it transforms our economy. You see, when we give our money away for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel, we are positioning ourselves in God's economy and not man's. We are placing ourselves in in God's economy and not ours. One time I told a guy, I knew in high school that I was studying theology in college. And he looked at me and said, are there a lot of jobs in that? And I said, I really actually never thought about it. I'm kind of nervous now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> See, God's economy is different. We use our money differently. We, we think about money differently. We think about everything differently because of the way the gospel has transformed our lives. Don't you see what Paul is saying? Don't you see what he's saying? By their approval of this service, they will glorify God, verse 13, because of your submission that comes from what? Your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. We, by the Holy Spirit, are doing something different than other people are doing with their money. Don't you see what God is doing by the Spirit with your generosity and what the Spirit is doing in your heart? 
Many of us need it written on the back of our cars. Tithing ain't easy. But what's the Spirit doing even in this difficult work? He's taking something we tend to idolize. He's divorcing us from it. And He's making us willing, generous, cheerful, faithful, and hopeful givers unto the Lord. Oh, how the Gospel transforms our hearts in giving. Oh, how the Gospel of grace motivates us to give heartily unto the Lord. Oh, how God's economy is so different than man's. Oh, how the Gospel pushes us to places we never thought possible. Thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus for the first time, I want you to know His grace is there for you today. And if you've ever wondered why Christians are willing to give their money away or willing to help others or are willing to do things to, 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 that cost them a lot of money to just simply to help others, it's because Jesus has been good to us when we didn't deserve it. And so we are generous in return. God will be good to you today. If you'll turn from your sins and repentance and put your faith in Jesus, I believe you will be saved. Second of all, Second of all, you may be a believer and you may say, Pastor, I just need some time to pray that God would change my heart. This altar is open for you. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means for you to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we need you. Thank you for giving of yourself to us, for giving your son to us. And God, even now, our prayer is that you would move in the hearts and minds of those who are here, even now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.